Hey everybody, I'm Zach. And I'm Jesse. And you're watching In Depth on Now You Know. Sponsored this week by A Better Root Planner. A Better Root Planner makes finding chargers an intuitive experience. When you're zoomed out, the highest power charging stations are displayed. When you zoom in, more lower power charging stations appear, helping you find the best charger on your way. Another feature making this a better root planner. And brought to you by Bior, or Build Your Own Robot Kit. Bring robotics to the kids' level. All right, so this week on In-Depth, we're going to be talking with Mark Fronmeyer. He's the president of Arkimoto. Those are those three-wheeled, fun utility vehicles. And Mark, thank you so much for joining us this week. How's it going, guys? Really going good. good. Thank you. We just got back from the Cybertruck event, so we're we're still like uh, having Recovering. our, our yeah. brain melted. Mind expanded. <laughs> See, you know what? It's so funny is I, I, I think the big story is I, I love the amount of press that those guys, that Tesla's gotten on is just fantastic. I put in a, a pre-order for Arkimoto's first Cybertruck because why would we ever tow a trailer with a diesel truck ever again? after that. But one thing I, I think that, that I haven't seen anybody mention is the delivery van market, right? You've got a vehicle that's made out of sh like sh folded sheet metal origami. They can make that into any shape that they want without having to make a bunch of new custom stamping tools. Right. And so you've got, yeah, there's a $150 billion pickup truck market. There's also a $150 billion delivery van market. And they are the, if you look at the pricing on it, they're just going to eat everybody's lunch once again in an entirely different top-end vehicle market. And I, not even a single word mentioned about it. The other thing that I think is so funny is that it, it, all the comments around styling. It's like, if I am buying for a fleet, I, am, I care about one thing, which is what does it cost to operate it over the lifespan of the vehicle? That's it. What they have put forward is just a, a, a smoke and value proposition. But I mean, and to your point, I mean, if you are going to have it be a fleet vehicle, it doesn't hurt to have it be eye catching because you just throw, you know, Bob's, uh, you know, landscaping. landscaping or whatever on there. And then it's like, oh, uh, free, free marketing because it looks way different than anything else on the road. So everyone's just going to be like, what is that? <laughs> Better call that dudes just so I can find out. That may factor into a vehicle that we are producing as well. In terms of the the deliverator, that that whole value proposition of putting, yeah, having a having a vehicle that that as as you guys know draws just massive amounts of attention on the street, it's a, it becomes a fantastic branding platform. Yeah, I mean, and to that point, I mean, so we were super lucky enough to to be able to go to New York um, and drive around on the FUV, the fun utility vehicle, and. Um, thank you so much for for having us down. That was so much fun. We got to you know zip around New York City. So A, that was the most fun I've had driving around New York City yeah. ever in anything, on anything. Um, that was, it was just super, a ton of fun. And I feel like an idiot because you call this thing the fun utility vehicle and I didn't get why you called it that. I was like, no, oh, it's a fun looking <laughs> shape. And I feel so stupid because it is super fun to ride. You know, and, and it wasn't originally called the fun utility vehicle at all. It was called the SRK. It was sort of a restatement of our, our core values, simple, reasonable, kick ass. Uh, but uh, when, when we gave people rides, it was just one after another, after another, after another would tell us this is, you know, this is the most fun I've ever had in a vehicle or this is the most fun I've ever had driving. And eventually we said, you know, we should, we should probably lead with fun on, on the brand. Uh, just in, in terms of it just really is it, that, that open air driving experience, the ability to see everything around you, having torque and be able to see your wheels and know where you're going. And it all adds up to a, to a pretty darn fun ride. When we were in LA, we saw the slingshot at the um, the LA Auto Show, and that's a three yeah. that's a three wheel vehicle. Um, it's not electric, um, but now that I've been on the fun utility vehicle, I realized that they're two completely different things. I think to a lot of people, they're like, "Oh, well, they're both three wheel vehicles." the The slingshot, you're down low in this cockpit, and you're you're removed from your environment, right? Because it, you're you're sitting way down, you're far away from everything. And the funny thing was we were seeing people do test rides in them and uh, they would stall all the time. And it was so funny to see that because they'd be driving along and all of a sudden they go Gong! and uh, uncomfortable looking because, yeah. you know, you have the like, <laughs> you know, the, the jerk and uh, you only get the jerk in the FUV when you 
when you really want it. Right. So I, I mean that to me it was like actually we don't want we don't want any jerks in the FDB. it wasn't no it wasn't jerky like it wasn't super duper it's all selected out. yeah it wasn't jerky but it was super powerful i mean and i was really surprised by that i mean for the look i, I don't know if my my brain wasn't expecting the amount of get up and go that that thing had and i was just i was blown away by it have, have you heard about electric vehicles? Yeah, I know. Got a lot of torque. I know. And no, I, I'm, I'm totally kidding. I'm totally kidding. <laughs> it, but the thing was, I was thinking like, I was thinking like small equals leaf power, and it's it's not. It's sort of the I mean the the, the old the old uh, power to weight ratio is power divided by weight. So if you if you decrease weight, you actually increase power to weight without having to increase power. Yeah, no, I know. And I feel like such an idiot because I the whole time I was just like, this is so much fun. And the other thing was when we were in New York, um, we've driven through New York in a, a couple of interesting vehicles, the, the Model X right when it first came out. Um, and that turned a lot of heads. Um, and I drove around in the Model 3 when the, when the Model 3 first came out, and that turned a lot of heads. But the, the FUV turned everybody's head. Yes. Everybody was looking at this thing, and everyone was yelling and just being like, what is that thing? Whoa! Oh, my gosh! And everyone was doing it. It wasn't just the, the car guys. It wasn't just the, you know, there were women being like, that's cute! And then the, on the next street corner, there was a guy being like, that's a cool car! And it's like... Cute for women, <laughs> cool for men. How do you get both wrapped up in the same package? And I was like, this is a winner that we're driving around in. Yeah, you, you, you sort of think of it, well, it's, you know, it's a three-wheeled vehicle. There aren't, they're pretty uncommon on the road. I, I have been surprised that it's that it really, it's not like, hey, 3% of people react to it in a favorable way. It's, and, and particularly in, in a city like New York, where, you know, traffic is just, congestion is really, really bad. I think people look at it and they're like, wow, that thing, that thing looks like fun. That thing looks like it would get me through this, this hellish traffic scape that I'm in, in a much more pleasant way. And you, you sort of realize driving it in, in a city like New York, that you're, you're, you're pretty much the only person on the road actually having a good time. Everyone else is, is you know, when you're in a car, you're like, I don't know where my car stops and the other cars begin. Uh, it's it's just a, a, a real nightmare to maneuver around. Whereas in the FUV, you've really just got so much more more room on the road, and you can just kind of imagine like, wow, what what would it be like if all the vehicles here were this size? It would be way more fun for everyone. Yeah, I felt like I was driving around a scalpel because I can see my wheel. And the other thing that the thing that you were pointing out as we were driving along was that the the shape of the vehicle is a T. So th right. this is the only car in the world where you can just hook your wheel in front of somebody and now they can't go because you just, you're in front of them now. Well, I, ideally you're not, you know, and, and it is, it is a, to be clear, it is a motorcycle class vehicle. It is actually not a car, but it, it, it have, being able to sort of hook a traffic lane with your wheel and you're not actually preventing them from moving because you're going to move before they do, right? You're going to, you know, you've got the torque to, 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 to move faster into the lane than the car that you're, you're actually getting in, in front of. I found, I don't know, at least in, in, the, in my experience, other car drivers were actually, they, they weren't honking at us all the time or anything because you're not actually taking up room on the road that they would be able to take up. You, you get out of their way very quickly. And so, you know, the, the, the net effect is just sort of better throughput. Yeah. And, and I mean, they're just happy to look at the vehicle because they've, they've never seen anything like it. And so it's, it's kind of exciting. They're just like, well, what is this? I do want to get a better look at it. Thank you for pulling in front of me. I, I think that that's one of those sort of proof points where you go, OK, this actually could uh, really make a big difference in terms of reducing congestion and, uh, and, and making the road more pleasant for everybody. Because if you take a car off the road and, and replace it with something that's a third of the space, that's just a lot more people that can get through that same road. Yeah, so we, we talked to a lot of startups that are you know one year in, two years into development of whatever vehicle they're working on. Um, I'd like to hear from you what it looks like to be at about two years in, because you are 12 years into Arkimoto's life. Can you tell me what it was like if we go back 10 years, um, I, what did it look like? I think it, two years in, I was starting to get the sense for just what a what an incredibly challenging journey it was going to eventually be, to build to build an actual in market vehicle product 
And at that point, we didn't even know what it was that we were building, right? It's like, it's sort of like, hey, there's, there's gold in those hills and you know, head, head in the direction of the answer. Um, but, but we didn't, it, it was, we, we knew it was gonna be three wheels. We knew it was gonna be you know, two wheels in front, one wheel in back. We'd already established that that was a very fun platform to drive even at that point. Uh, but in terms of the, the full product and then actually bringing it into production, uh, that, was, that was still looking. And I think at that point I was thinking, all right, we'll probably have this done in, in three or four years. I had no idea that it was gonna be another decade to actually get it into full production. Uh, the, the amount of, of, of work necessary to even just to raise the money to go into production, to, to really prove out a new vehicle type, and then to, to, to find a, a solution that is going to be that's going to really have a market. Uh, the, the, the challenge I think with a lot of, uh, a lot of EV companies has been finding a, a whole business case that actually makes sense. And if you don't do that, then you end up spending tons and tons and tons of cash and, and going bust. And we've just seen that sort of over and over and over again uh, with, with a, a very small number of exceptions to that rule. Right, because I mean, there are CEOs that are in place now for the big car companies that are experienced people. They've been in this industry for decades and decades and nothing against that experience, except that when you're trying to innovate, I feel like that holds you back because you already know how hard things are. And so if someone comes to you with like, hey, let's try out this new idea, you're like, oh my God, that's right. a decade of hard Do work. Do you know all the hurdles <laughs> we're gonna be running into? Instead of looking at it as this long line of hurdles, if you're looking at it and you're just saying like, I can see the, the the end point, or at least I know the direction that I'm going in. I think that, yeah, I think that a lot of uh, successful companies and a lot of su successful businesses, they didn't know what the hurdles were when they first started. And that was actually an advantage to yeah. them. Well, I think if I had had any con concept at the beginning of just how hard it was going to be, there's no way I would have done it. No way. I, I would, you know, I, the, the longest project, single project I'd ever worked on uh, before starting Arkhamoto was about two and a half years uh, making, it, it, making a AAA, you know, this is when I was working in the AAA computer games business. And that was uh, just a, a huge grind uh, to, you know, in terms of just, you go through a, multiple phases of burnout through a project, lots of crunch time and so on. I think, that, and this has been five times longer than that. And, and through it, you know, just, I, I think the other challenge has been Again, again, just when you're when you're a, an, at an automotive company, the way that, that cars have been made for decades has remained virtually unchanged. Um, you've got stamped steel panels, you spot weld them all together, and then bolt everything to, off, and off it goes. The way that they're marketed, the way that they're sold, the way that they're serviced. I mean, this has been many decades. Uh, uh, doing it sort of the same way. So when you're doing a new automotive program, you just go, okay, well, we're just gonna sort of do exactly the same thing as we did last time and add a few more buttons and uh, you know, put in a few more boxes and move the price point up a little bit. But we're in an era right now where one, it's, it's very obvious that that model is, is, is choking the planet, it, both in terms of, of the congestion of our cities and then uh, CO2 emissions, climate change, which, which presents really an existential threat. And then at the same time, you've got just massive advances in technology for batteries, for electronics uh, and software that are saying, okay, it's, it's time to rethink these very basic platforms. And I think you could see that, you totally saw that with the unveiling of the Tesla truck. And that's in, in, in terms of what we're doing, we're going after a, a brand new platform that is, it's born to be electric. It's, it takes advantage of dif a different kind of packaging because it's an electric vehicle. What's interesting about the cyber truck is that a lot of people we heard the very first night were writing to us and like, I'll never drive that, that's ugly. And then the next morning, the same people would write back to us and say, you know what? I kind of like it. <laughs> it's kind of grown on and me. And I think this- and, and I mean, come on, trucks are ugly. They're all ugly. Like, who are you kidding? They just, they're, they're just what's normal. That's it, right? And to go back to Arkhamoto for a second, I think a lot of people might say to themselves like, three-wheel vehicle, what? But I think that that's because you've just never experienced it before. As soon as you either see your friend on it or you hop on it, you're gonna go, oh, totally makes sense. Like, the, there's so many positives here. Right. 
Yeah, and, and, and I think not, it's not to say styling is unimportant. And I think to, to uh, Jesse, to your, to your point, the reaction of people on the street, like, oh, that looks cool. That's, that looks fun. That looks, oh, that looks cute. Um, you, kind of, you kind of get a chance to, when you have something new, you get a chance to sort of project. Uh, it, it's, it's a new thing. You get to have a fresh evaluation. Um, and so to, to me, what, what, I think, what I think I like about uh, the Arkimoto and, and what I like about the Tesla truck is it's the, there's a, an expression that, that a, a, a venture capitalist once told me, a uh, former Google guy, he said, function is beauty. Right, it's 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 a the next step of form follows function, but it's like really when you have something that where you can see the function of it, and that function is necessary and important, then that becomes a beautiful form. Yeah, when we we've, we've been doing a lot of traveling this past few months, and when we go to a city like London, I would turn to Jesse, and we both almost have the same idea at the same time. He would we both go, "This is a perfect city for Arkhamoto," <laughs> yeah. and then we were in L.A. in this last trip, and we're like. Perfect city for Arkhamoto. Yeah. And like every city we've gone to, it's like, yeah, this is perfect for Arkhamoto. Right. I mean, just from the parking standpoint, from the from the point that the, the roads are just like, they're woefully inadequate for the cars that are on them currently. Yeah. It's just like, what were what was everyone thinking when they made this? I mean, I'm really excited to take it out into the country because I, I, I love the way that it rode. I mean, when we finally actually got it up to some speed in New York, it was like, oh, this is really fun. Um, so I can't wait to, you know, take it through some curvy roads with some some beautiful scenery because you can see everything. I just wrapped up. Uh, we, we've been on this this kind of nationwide launch tour. Uh, going uh, going full Greta, so we're doing it on the ground, um, and uh, and we were just I'm I'm here in lovely Panama City Beach, Florida, so we're we're coming up the Florida coast, and I'm it's just city after city after city where it's this is a perfect place there, it, it, and down here it's you know it's it's beautiful and sunny all the time. There are golf cart communities everywhere you look, and so this is sort of it's it is a. It is a great vacation and luxury vehicle for a place like this, whereas in a place like New York, it, we, we literally found that you, we could drive it across town and beat Google Maps times by 20%. So midtown to downtown, we would beat, it was like a six minute savings over Google Maps. And that's, that's a, a great convenience feature for a consumer. It's money for a delivery driver. I mean, that's, that, is, that is dollars in the pocket. You can park it more easily. You can get across town more easily. That's time and time is money. So it, it has a, it, there's, the, there's, a, there's definitely the fun thesis. And when you think about vehicles like the Slingshot, where you've got this, the open air drive experience, uh, the, you know, that, those are definitely, it, the, the Arkhamoto fits well within that fun category. But it also, for us, the, the, the really important thing is to nail the utility thesis. And so that's what that's what reducing congestion is all about. That's what um, having a, a great delivery vehicle is all about. That's what the rapid responder is all about. Yeah. So let's talk about the deliverator for a minute, because, I mean, yeah, in a city like New York, if I want a pizza from, you know, my favorite pizza joint halfway across town and someone's driving an Arkhamoto versus a Honda Civic. And as you say, you can get across town 20 percent faster. My pizza's warmer. Yeah. I'm a happier person. I get my pizza <laughs> delivered faster. Um and that's true of, of, of boxes and, and, you know, uh, deliveries and everything like that. Do you, like, what do you imagine a fleet of deliverators would mean for a, a, a company in New York City? As we look at it, there is a sea change happening in the delivery market, again, because of technology. You have this profusion of food delivery apps. Every grocery store is now moving, it seems, towards uh, the ability to deliver groceries same day. You have companies like Amazon saying, "Hey, we're we're gonna you know we're moving from two day being the standard to one day being the standard, and eventually, and the writing is on the wall. I want my thing. I want it now. So that it's gonna be same day, thirty minute delivery of in in every major metro area. That is going to require a totally different way of doing looking at delivery because if you're if you've got the, the, the UPS model or the uh, FedEx model where you load up the truck at eight in the morning or six in the morning and you send it out for the full day of deliveries around town, that, is a, that, that model is optimized for your package is going to show up somewhere between eight in the morning and four o'clock at night. If it, instead it is this item needs to get 
uh, you know, on a 15 minute journey within 30 minutes, that says, okay, well, th then the, the, the emphasis isn't so much on how much can you pack into a single truck, it's on the, the, how quickly can I deliver the service. Um, and the, the nice thing about the Deliverator platform is it packs a lot of stuff into a very small platform. And, you know, you say that the writing's on the wall, it's going in this direction. And what a wonderful thing that we actually have an electric vehicle that's going to be able to fulfill this purpose. And that it's not just going to be a bunch of like motorcycles or uh, big diesel delivery trucks that are going to have to try and, uh, you know, carry through this this crazy thing that it has to happen because the market desires it, that we could have deliverators doing this, this thing with zero emissions. It all kind of goes back to the basic thesis of the platform, which is that almost all the trips on the road today are one or two people traveling with a relatively small amount of stuff, a relatively short distance. And as soon as you shift, the, the, the just-in-time delivery looks a lot more like your typical consumer trip than it does today's big box delivery trip. And let's bring this one step further. When we saw the Cybertruck, minutes later, Jesse and I turned to each other and said, police forces, like police departments across the nation are gonna say, Cybertruck, yeah, that makes sense to have one of those as a bulletproof truck. <laughs> so let's look at your rapid responder. Right, I mean, you're, gonna it, have, you're gonna have municipalities going, we need this in our arsenal. Right. If you can get across uh, New York in 20% faster following the rules of the road, imagine what happens when you put a siren on top and you're allowed to drive through red lights. I mean, uh, that's gonna be insane. When we were in New York uh, a couple of weeks ago, we were uh, at one point stuck behind an ambulance trying to make its way up 6th Avenue. And it was, the road was packed. There was, there, was no, there was no way for people to pull out of their lanes. So the ambulance was just stuck. And you know, I, I had a couple of thoughts. One, I would hate to be on the other end of that call. And two, if they were in a rapid responder, the cars don't have to move all the way out of their lanes. They just need to open up a little bit and all of a sudden that, that guy can go through. So, so we really think the rapid responder does have the potential to dramatically reduce response times for emergency services and that's, you know, every minute, every second counts when somebody has had a stroke or has had a heart attack or has had gone into shock from, uh, from an allergic reaction or something like that, where you really need to get somebody on the scene as quickly as possible. And that's, yeah, it's a, it's a, that is a product that we are very excited about. Uh, just from the potential to actually save lives. We invest in a lot of uh, electric companies, um, but usually we do it at a very low level because it's fun and we just love the cause. And we started doing that, I'll be honest, with uh, FUV, with, with Arkimoto, um, when we heard about you a while back. And we've just been increasingly uh, loading up on FUV stock. Jesse and I are both long on Arkimoto. And that is because as we learn more and more about your company, we're, I mean, we're not, financial experts by any means, but we're pretty sure that you have a winning strategy because um, you're no longer just in kind of the startup mode of like an idea sk sketched on the wall. You have a factory, you have thousands of people pre-ordered your product, we've driven in the product, it's real and it's awesome. And then there's all of these use cases for the product. So I know that you're, you know, you probably can't speak to all of these things, but I just feel like you're onto something huge here. And my next question, I guess, as an investor is, you're at, you've gone from the stage of having to develop this thing and make it work and get it uh, to pass all the regulations. Now you're at the point where I guess you have to start ramping up. And I know that for many companies, that's a very difficult stage to be in. Can you speak about what that's like to be in this kind of new phase of the company? The previous phase, I, can, I have these, these sort of uh, flashbacks to the summer and then last spring where we were just, it was just, obstacle after obstacle in the finalization process, in the, in the certification process, and then all the testing that we did uh, on things that are not typically present on a motorcycle, like seat belts and the, you know, the, the roof and the windshield wiper and uh, the, the kind of full laundry list there. So, and that was, that was really, a, a, I would say, a, a pretty excruciating process, I think, because it took us, uh, it took us longer than we thought it was originally gonna take and we watched the summer go by and we weren't driving on the road. And so, you know, now is this, it, it's just, it feels like a, a whole different company. We're actually, we have a, for the first time in, in 12 years, we have real revenue of the retail series, uh, production vehicle, we have customers who are you know, reporting back saying, 
hey, this thing is, I absolutely love it. I mean, I just, I look back, I look at our testimonials on uh, the Facebook, uh, we have a, a Facebook group of owners that's, that where people are talking about their initial experiences. Uh, a lot of the, 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 the taste makers such as yourselves uh, are confirming that as well. And so that's, there's, I, I would say it's very gratifying to be in this, in this phase of, of the company's history. Because for, for many, many years, Arkimoto was, a, you know, I was, I was playing the role of the little boy who cried wolf, where it was just, you know, there's, there, there is a wolf out there. I know it. Please, you know, please believe me. Uh, and, and now I can actually, so, but, but the, the, it was always a future vision. It was always something that were, was going to come someday. Uh, and so I think being able to move the story of Arkimoto into the present and, and actually be delivering to customers is immensely gratifying, but it's also incredibly challenging. It's, it's a big climb still in front of us. I think the advantage that we have versus perhaps some of the, the other, you know, versus say a car is that we are building something that is much less complicated than a car. I feel like a lot of other companies get to your point, they've got their prototype made and they've got some funding and then they go to China and then they have to start getting relationships with Chinese factories and keep their quality control high. But you're completely different. You have a factory in Eugene, Oregon, and you have a dedicated um, staff of folks who have been with you, seems like the whole time. Uh, tell us about AMP. Tell us about what makes that different. Our whole model, for, I, I think from, from just the outset, the idea that we need to go thousands of miles across the sea to build the products that we're going to use here on a daily basis. We've never totally understood that, that whole concept. We think it makes a lot more sense that the, these big, heavy machines and, and an Arkimoto is a third of the weight of a car, but it's still, that's a, a thousand pounds plus of materials. You got to move around and bolt together. It doesn't, to, to me, it's never made a lot of sense to, to do that somewhere else and then bring it here. We have a, a, a fantastic manufacturing base in the United States. Uh, and so, and, and as, so, so as we look at the world, we want to be the hometown team wherever we go to market. Uh, we want to, it, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to build vehicles in Eugene and ship them to China for the Chinese market. When it comes to the AMP, what we built there was we said, okay, we wanna be able to, to sort of be the masters of our destiny in terms of the manufacturing of the things that are custom to the vehicle. The, the chassis, the cage, the suspension components, the, thing that, the things that really make the Arkimoto distinct from every other vehicle on the road. Uh, and then, we're, and then also have the assembly facilities to put all those pieces together. All right, so I wanna ask you a question about charging um, because from my experience owning a couple different electric vehicles and using uh, a couple different electric vehicles, I've gone from using Sparky, which is a Model X, to a Leaf, to a Model 3. And so the, the biggest difference that I've noticed is that uh, charging Sparky, the Model X, and charging my car you can put the same amount of power in the car and you get vastly different mileages uh, per hour out of the, the charging rate just because one car is more efficient than the other. And so I know that the Arkimoto is extremely efficient and it has a very small battery, um, which still gives it a very decent range. I mean, like 100 miles of city range is uh, that's that's about better than my leaf. <laughs> um and so I'm just trying to figure out how quickly does it charge on level two? Uh, on level two, it's about a four. So, so it's, I think we've got a four kilowatt charger in there. It's about a four hour charge, four hours and change to charge on a level two. And yeah, I mean, to your point, the, the 100 miles is about a little bit more than three times the average daily miles driven across the US. So, so it is, and this is everything about what we've been focusing on really is about that urban suburban thesis. We, we don't envision this at least today as your long haul high speed commuter vehicle where you're going you know, uh, 100 miles each way every day through, through dense LA traffic at 80 miles plus per hour. So, so what we're thinking about really is that it's more the, the community electric vehicle. If you've got a, a golf cart, which is a neighborhood electric vehicle that's kind of constrained to a neighborhood, it can only go 25 miles an hour. With the FUV, you can go on all the roads, but it really, the sweet spot is daily driving. Yeah, yeah. It's a utility vehicle uh, that's smaller that, than an SUV. And, and that I, you finally figured out is fun. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I, again, I feel super dumb that I didn't, I knew that it was like, oh, it's, I, 
Yeah, I until I experienced it, and that's the funny thing because we are always telling people on the show like you have to go sit in an electric vehicle to understand it. Um, and I think that the FUV is in a class of its own where you need to sit in an FUV to understand exactly what it does and what it is. A lot of the kind of micro scale vehicles that have come out before have been super low slung. So you're, you kind of get down way down and you just feel like you're in this very diminutive space and, and, and a little bit claustrophobic. Whereas be, just because of how we packaged the Arkimoto, uh, and it really all came down to wanting to get two big people into the vehicle and have you know, that, that necessitated handlebars. It also means that you sit up at about the height of a crossover. So you've got, you actually have a big, a much more expansive view of the road. People can see you, which we think is going to be a, a significant benefit just in terms of basic safety. Um, but it also gives you this much more, uh, your, your, this tilted, rotated up perspective on where you know where you can go, where, where your wheels are, what the path of travel is. There, there isn't another vehicle on the market, to my knowledge, that delivers that same experience. And so, just tell uh, people watching, like, if what is kind of your next? Obviously, you're selling them. You can go onto the website and get pre-order them. But uh, what's another way to experience the Arkimoto? So we did. Uh, we we just the the terminus of the trip was in Key West, uh, Florida, where we delivered our very first two. FUVs to our very first rental franchise. And so the, the way that we are planning for people to experience the vehicle in market uh, is, is not through a, a dealership and not through uh, a, a, just a, a retail store, but actually through, through rental stores. And so we're gonna be opening up some of our own rental stores in key destinations, and then working with, with both franchise partners. So you can sort of think of it like as if, uh, you, know, you know, Hertz, owns some of their own Hertz outlets, and then they also franchise. We are sort of like a Hertz, but we also have our own factory producing our own unique vehicle. And that we think is going to be just a fantastic way. We're, we're being fairly selective about where we are placing our initial rental locations, but, but ultimately the, the plan is to just have anywhere that is a, a, a fun destination with lots of tourist traffic or lots of convention traffic, Las Vegas, Hawaii, Southern California, the, uh, the Hamptons, the Nantucket, uh, you can just kind of think about where, where people go uh, and where, where do people rent fun vehicles. We think that if you've had a, a half a day or a day in an Arkimoto rental that you'll have come up with a long list of reasons why you should probably have one in your own driveway. Mm -hmm. I completely <laughs> agree with that because after we came back, I was like, mm, man, I really want one. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, that's a really smart way to do it because when you're on vacation, what a fun, I mean, that's an experience. People want experiences to remember and being able to go for a ride through a place that you might have, you know, biked through before or walked through before, but now getting to experience it in a different way. But let's be honest, you only drove through. True. You know, you were only True. in the car with the windows up. True. Um, and being able to have that experience on the vehicle, that's going to be... That's going to be really, really yeah, a it's different gonna, It's going to make it memorable. It was a different experience riding through New York. Right. I've driven through New York. I've had to slog through New York before, like on my own two feet. And uh, I've taken the subway, unfortunately. Um, and this is, this is the best way to get through New York. Right. Definitely. Awesome. Well, thank you for spending time with us today, Mark, and telling us all about uh, what's going on with Arkimoto. I think our viewers are going to be super interested in this. And so um, if they want to check in on re you know, rental opportunities, should they go to your website to find out where the latest are? We will have, we'll have a whole page on, uh, actually, I think we do have a sort of a, a landing teaser page on the rentals currently. Uh, and then as we open up each new store, we'll, we'll highlight those. The initial locations are in Florida. Uh, we delivered our very first, our very first rental vehicle went to Go Car Tours in San Francisco. So San Francisco and then Southern California, you'll, we'll have these pockets popping up. And then over the course of the next 12, 18, 24 months, we should see a lot more of those in, in markets that are accessible to lots of folks. And then even if we have friends, we have friends in New Zealand. Can they get in one too, Mark? Yeah. Funny you should mention. We actually did. A, how did I forget? We, we did our, our, our very first international delivery happened about, uh, well, three weeks ago. We, we loaded up a container with the first three FUVs headed for New Zealand. New Zealand is our first international market. We believe that the, that the FUV has worldwide potential, I think, you know, Southeast Asia, Europe, Africa, 
uh, South America. New Zealand is, is, our, is sort of our, our test of how do we actually deploy vehicles, how do, we, what, how do we service those relationships, and then that will lead to, we think, more, more opportunities all around the world. But yes, if you, if you are in New Zealand, my understanding is that they will be doing test rides and rentals starting in the new year. Mark, thank you so much for joining us this week on In-Depth. I know you've got a busy schedule ahead of you, and uh, we are just so excited about the future of the fun utility vehicle. Thank you so much for joining us this week as our viewers, and we're going to see you next week on In-Depth. Now you know.